This is uh, Intro to Computers. Um, here we're going to be going over a few basic topics. Uh, most of the things uh, that you'll be doing in general office environment and how the basics of Windows uh, works in the current environment, which is Windows 10. So we're gonna go over computer hardware, logging into Windows 10, the desktop interface, uh, software, web browsers, um, most of the most popular ones in general, uh, malware in general, viruses, some security stuff, uh, applications, managing files and forwards, emails and social media, um, your next steps after this class, if you feel that you wish to, um, to learn more, we have quite a few uh, certifications and classes that can help you uh, advance basically anywhere in office in the IT field these days. And then we'll do a short question and answers, a questions and answer period. So a brief history of computers. Um, how many here own a computer? Um, just any kind, tablet, Apple, PC, Um, I ask what everyone with the first computer is. Most people uh, would very likely say one of the early IBM pieces. Uh, this would most likely be one of the World War II uh, supercomputers. Um, might actually be the first thinking machine from the 1800s, but that's going into pretty complicated, uh, weird history. Uh, the Abacus is generally what's considered the first computer, uh, mostly for the term counting frame. And that's because computer has a very, very strict definition, and that is a calculating tool that, can be, that, that was in use in centuries before the adaptation of written machines. That's for Abacus. Uh, computers in general usually usually defined as a thing that computes, which is a very wide definition. Uh, computers in the World Wide Web. Uh, the first major computer for public use would be uh, the one designed, ones designed by uh, Bill Gates. These fell off the original uh, GUI systems of DOS. These were invented in 1975. And shortly after that, uh, Steve Jobs broke off from their group and formed Apple. They are the two biggest players in the PC market today, though I believe Samsung is currently beating up both of them globally. Uh, computers are able to store, retrieve, and process. Uh, with the World Wide Web, you can basically connect to and research anything on the internet and connect to globally. It also facilitates communication. Basically anything you could be doing in a modern economy, you need the internet for. Uh, what makes up a computer are two things. Um, that would be hardware and software. Those are the two things that make up all computers at their most broad basis. Uh, so these are the general parts of any current computer today. Um, you might have a few other peripherals. You might have slightly different versions of these, but this is what would be considered a normal office computer. So the system link, usually called a tower these days, uh, a printer, a keyboard, mouse, monitor, and speakers. Uh, printer is a bit more optional than the others. Uh, speakers can be, replaced with, can be replaced with the headset, but you know. Laptops, which are becoming more common in offices these days, are a bit more simple in how many parts they have, or how many parts they have on the desk, but are more complicated to build. Um, as you can see, we have a short layout of all the major parts of the average laptop. Um, I'm sure everyone here is in general aware of uh, what goes into the, into the basic look of a laptop, though each one can be a little different based on what uh, company made them or what their purpose is. Uh, gaming laptops tend to have many more connections than an office laptop, which will have, which would be made towards being more power efficient and smaller. 
Uh, laptops actually have their own lingo. It's usually weird defined terms. Uh, USB port. These are standard across all computers. They're the universal serial bus. Uh, these are used for the majority of any kind of uh, computer parts these days. Um, most people right now will be connecting their mouse or their phone with a USB plug. Uh, the, that's how they charge in most cases. It's the easiest way to do that. Um, the way these uh, operate is using numerous inputs and outputs to control things in a rapid uh, in a rapid serial connection. HD, this is the current standard for laptops, though some do go beyond HD into 4K. These are a bit more expensive. HD laptops, it just means a high definition. It means you're going to get more pixels and better and better resolution, which makes your uh, screen look, look more crisp and gets you better uh, wide frame detail. This is especially good for things like image editing, video editing, or if you're making a lot of um, PowerPoints. Your ethernet connection is your internet connection. This looks very similar to a phone cord uh, that you have seen. I think they still have, I think a lot of, of uh, landlines still use this exact cord type. Um, but ethernet is starting to overtake those as well. Um, this is a broader, a broader bandwidth connection type uh, than a phone cable and is uh, the current standard for all wired connections in any uh, WAN network, which is a wired area network, uh, which is what you'd see in most offices these days. Uh, the webcam, usually on the top of the laptop, uh, right above the screen, uh, this is the camera that you can connect to the laptop's network. Uh, a mouse, fairly universal to all, all computers now. Uh, though touchpad uh, mice are becoming more common, especially uh, touch screens with tablets. Uh, mouse is almost always two buttons and the scroll wheel. Uh, some will have side con uh, control buttons, usually for b uh, front and back operations. So you can uh, control certain functions like undo, redo, or front or go back and forward on a browser. Uh, touch screen, touchpad controls, more common on laptops, uh, have four alternate functions, and then some have uh, more wide, complicated functions. These are usually used uh, on how to view things in different ways, uh, to scroll, pinch, flip, and rotate. Each one of these has slightly different functions. Uh, the scroll function, which is done with two, ping two fingers, up or down. I do not have a laptop here with uh, that function that you can see. Um, those tend to be just for scrolling up and down on larger documents. Uh, pinching, which is uh, done through this motion, when you put your fingers on, on the touchpad and do that, uh, that will zoom in and out. This is very similar to how it works on a smartphone. Uh, the flip function, uh, this has become a bit rarer these days and is only used in video editing. Um, that is to rotate and flip a, an image on a, a directly vertical or horizontal frame, whereas rotate, which is right below that, uh, will rotate it in a pivot of 90 degrees. Uh, the average keyboard is a bit more complicated than uh, most people we use in their daily lives. Uh, we have the escape key function, escape function and typewriter keys, which are where most people keep their daily business. Um, the extra keys in the middle, on the middle right, are used for a series of alternate functions, mostly in text editors or in uh, taking screenshots. Uh, the numeric pad, usually used for calculations these days, are becoming less common and are usually not included in most laptops now. Uh, this is the normal typing uh, position for hands. 90% of typing classes will teach you to use this specific position. It's meant to keep it so your hands are always in the exact right position to get to the next key you need to type faster. Um, we actually do a typing class that teaches people how to do this. Um, it's not a, incredibly difficult, though it is kind of hard to get a, a handle on when you first start. 
Uh, Michael, is everyone uh, with me so far? Before I go on, does anyone have questions? We can gauge where everyone is uh, on standard for the current com for the current computer systems. Let's do a short poll. Make sure we have everyone. Uh, we can we can focus on where people need a focus. Do we have um, is everyone here? Is everyone watching? Amaraj uh, Namdi? Ah, um, okay, perfect. Oh, we have a good consensus there going. That's always that's actually much easier to organize. Uh, finding your desired software really depends on two things. If you're trying to f find new software to add to the computer that will do what you need it to do, or how to find it in the computer uh, to do exactly what you need to do. Um, we have a little bit on how to find software a little later. Um, those can be quite difficult if you're not familiar with how to search for specific things, especially if you have an idea in mind that you need to work with and you don't know what software will facilitate that function. This can be especially difficult with programs like Excel. So the inner workings of a computer are actually fairly simple, at least on the very wide basis. Um, anything you, anything called input will be uh, typing, clicking, uh, putting in information of any type that is always input. The computer will then process this in its CPU, which is the central part of any major computer. Uh, this will basically, depending on the software you're working with, this will work with your inputs. Um, the best description of this is a calculator. When you put in the information, when you hit enter, it ca it'll process it and then output the information you need, which is the last part, um, which is when it gives you back what you would have expected in the average, uh, out of the average input. Uh, the first software everyone uh, will see when they turn the computer is their operating system. Uh, this is the gra the interface for everything on a computer. Uh, every computer has to have one or it's generally not going to work. Uh, it runs your hardware and software. It basically organizes what the hardware does to work with the software. And the most three most popular are Windows, Mac, and Linux. There are a few other ones that are not really important to this discussion, but they can be quite useful if you're a more savvy user. Uh, Windows is controlled by Microsoft. Mac is the one by Apple. And Linux is a freeware version that is a bit more complicated to use and is mostly used by software developers, programmers, and IT professionals. Uh, Windows we're gonna, is the one we are going to stick with for most of this class. Um, we will touch on Apple mostly in discussion. Um, that's because New Horizons focuses mostly on Windows due to its pro its uh, proliferation in office environments and almost all schools these days. Uh, some arts departments and uh, marketing crews use uh, Mac, but they're kind of the exception more than the rule. So when you turn on a computer, you're gonna to get to this screen. Uh, usually it might not look exactly at that background, but those icons will look almost exactly the same. 
it will almost always have the time and date and whatever apps you have running unless you specifically change this. But by default, this is what it looks like. Uh, if you're not using the computer every 66 seconds, it will go back to this unless you specifically change that. Uh, that's mostly to keep people from being able to get into your computer uh, when you're not around. Uh, to continue using the computer, you, you'll tap or click on the screen, and that will get you to the sign-in screen, which will almost always look like this, again, unless you change the background. Um, most computers are operating on a, operate a sign-in. Uh, that means you're going to put in your username and your password. Most people use this at home, too. Um, I know some people don't. Uh, they specifically turn this off. Uh, right after you log in, that's going to take you to your desktop, which cycles into this. Again, background colors are going to be different, but this is in general what a default background looks like. It will almost always have a recycle bin. It will always have a taskbar on the bottom. And just in some general, in some general view, this is what it will look like. The start screen below the first time you log in, this is a, a default start screen. Uh, the tile desktop is mostly used in Windows 10 on touchscreen systems. It's not on most standard desktops. But that would be in current that's currently called the tile. The taskbar is the gray shaded area on the bottom. And pin and unpin is if you look at those two icons on the bottom of the folder and the explore button. If those are not grayed in and, and, and lit up, that means they're pinned there. Uh, when you right click on them, it will show a um, it'll show the fact that it's there all the time. So you can quick shortcut to those softwares. That makes it a little easier to find them day by day if they're especially common. I know some people actually do fill their taskbar with different applications they use day to day. Uh, the taskbar is where a lot of business is done. Uh, it's mostly because it's the best way to organize software that you have active. The start button on the bottom left, that's that Windows key with the four rectangles. Um, that is how you're going to pull up your, your normal start menu. Uh, to the right of that is the search bar. If you click that, you can type in any application, files, online terms if you're connected to the internet, or even the name of images, and it'll, it'll bring those up for you. Uh, Cortana is that little circle next to it. Not all computers have this right now. Some people have it, some systems have it disabled, especially on work computers. Um, it's very similar uh, to Siri or the OK Google system. Um, you would say the name Cortana if you have a headset or you would, um, you, or you would uh, just click that. And if you have a headset, it will let you uh, say what you need basically and it'll It'll bypass the need for a search bar. Uh, beware if you're using a Windows phone, which not all of them have Cortana set up, or if you're using a Google phone, saying OK Google or Cortana nearby it will cause it to turn on, which every time I say Cortana, my phone is doing, and I'm going to have to do something about that. <laughs> so beware of that, especially in an office. It can be kind of annoying in a meeting. I've seen it happen quite a few times. Uh, your task view is everything to the right. It's the uh, bottom right-hand corner. Uh, that is for rapid switching apps. And the apps are the little um, icons. Those, th those list every available app you have open currently or the ones you have pinned. The notification area is on the far bottom right. Uh, those display basic or important computer status. Like if you're on a laptop, it will always tell you what your battery charge rate is. Um, it will tell you if you have your touchscreen enabled or disabled, your internet access, and it will tell you your, your audio, time, and date. Uh, navigating desktop elements is a fairly intuitive process once you've sat with the computer for a little while. Uh, I have seen people who have not used one for years have a little trouble with this. Uh, your recycle bin is the icon that's on every desktop. It's fairly default and very difficult to get rid of. Um, not that you should. It's a good thing to keep around. Uh, if you hover over it, it'll have a little white icon next to it. It actually has it on the image here that displays in general what the icon is and tells you what it's doing at that time 
if it is doing anything. Uh, not all icons will be constantly active. The notification area, as I said before, shows you all general information of your computer. These can get fairly detailed depending on how you set it up or how many uh, hard, hard background uh, softwares you have running. This is especially useful for things like a VPN, um, these are, which are very common in businesses these days. Those let you get to them more quickly and to figure out if there's a problem. So the one that's pointed right now is your charge availability. That short is battery. Uh, the one next to that is internet access. It won't always look like that depending on how you're connected. If you're hard lined in, it will look like a monitor with a wire connected to it. And if you're on a VPN, it might have a company logo depending on what the VPN is. It says volume. It almost always looks like this. Uh, it looks like a speaker with sound coming out of it. Those, and that icon will also show you how loud it is depending on how uh, many waves come out of it. So now we're going to work on wireless networks, WAN networks, and LAN networks. Um, a WAN network is a very techy term for a Wi-Fi network. It's a wide area network, usually not wired into the computer. A LAN network is a local area network, which is almost always a wired connection. So if you're on a desktop that is um, connected, to, connected to your router directly through wire, that would be a LAN if you're connected to a wide ordinary network and it's connected to your Wi-Fi, generally a WAN. Those are very broad terms and they could be incorrect depending on specifically what's going on. Uh, so logging into, your, into uh, the average Wi-Fi network is you have to know this, the network name and the password. Almost all wireless networks have a password just by default. Uh, or you can plug directly into the router, which would be for a LAN network. Uh, once you do that, you're going to open your browser. Most common these days is Google Chrome or Firefox. Microsoft Edge is also a very good option. Uh, open the browser lets, lets you test the connection. Or you can go straight to your Windows Start screen, which will open all your main apps. And if there's an internet connection, it will usually also be broadcasting and showing you some general information. Uh, your start screen is what happens when you press the Windows button on the bottom left. It will always show you a list of your applications, general broadcast, and your Explore tips. The tile, the Explore tips and uh, production and productivity on the right are known as tiles. Um, that term became more common after Windows 8 became known for touchpads. So we're going to go through them very quickly. Uh, we're not going to focus too much on an individual app, more on a general uh, Windows 8 uh, application level and for multitasking. So multitasking is for computers is different from multitasking for a person. Uh, multitasking on a computer is using more than one app uh, and to switch and using one app to switch and to work side by side. The task view is the button directly next to search. It looks like a box with um, brackets next to it. This will let you multitask and swap between all main applications. This will always show you a series of thumbnails of the apps you're using, usually in a grid pattern. Uh, you can change the appearance, but it's generally easier to keep it in a grid. Otherwise, it gets a little overwhelming, which is why it says do not open too many. Um, you can select the app you want to load by interacting it by, or by clicking a right click and then to close it or it lets you just snap right or left, bring it up to the sides. Um, this also lets you do a few other functions such as forcing it to close if you right click it. This lets you, uh, like, uh, if you have a software that freezes, this is the easiest way to close it if you don't want to go into your control panel or if you don't want to open your uh, task manager. Uh, the divider between them allows you to resize them. Uh, this makes it a little easier to see what you're doing if you're multitasking, though it will still be smaller than if it was full screen, making it a little harder to read. Uh, next, we're going to go over creating files, files and folders and going over the desktop. Let's go back here. Um, so 
one of the one of the biggest issues uh, I find most people have is finding uh, certain files. Uh, what what you guys said? You're finding which software you're needing or how to find things on a desktop. Uh, these can be a little frustrating if you're not aware of how to go through your computer and find individual softwares or how to find individual images. Uh, the best way to do this is one, two. On the bottom right of the screen, on the bottom of the screen, you'll see this icon. Um, that is your, uh, your, your file explorer. That will let you bring up this screen. This is the easiest way to generally search through all of your files. Uh, so if you go through here, you can go through, say, your desktop. This will open what, everything that's on your desktop. Um, I don't have any videos or anything loaded on this, on this machine. Um, but if you were looking for something very specific, this is how you would do it. Um, to create a new folder, these are actually fairly simple. Uh, you would go into anywhere on your desktop or in the file manager. You're going to go to new and click folder. That lets you create a new one that we can, that you will then give a title to. Let's see that as new folder. Then you can open it and put whatever you need into it or take anything out if you did put anything into it. This is how you delete. Uh, the desktop works very similar to the file manager, but it only views what you have saved in your desktop. So software, this is what we spoke earlier, um, what we're looking for, you said you had some problems finding your software. Uh, let's go over quickly, what's your favorite type of software? We're gonna look over what you use most often uh, or just what you prefer keeping a use of. I know we have, uh, we've had in the past people who prefer video game, who use a lot of video games, you know, free time when you're at home. Spreadsheets is a very common answer. It's a lot of a lot of your work, daily work is done in spreadsheets, and browsers are probably the most common software people use day to day these days. Uh, mostly because you have to be on the internet. It's a requirement for most jobs now, daily life, or just you know cooking in some cases is best done through a browser, so you can find what you need for recipes. I don't know people who keep cookbooks around anymore. Uh, so software is a, a program that helps you perform a specific task. Or it's the way it's an application. Um, most people will just say software application is more of an individual tech term uh, for if you're looking for something very, very specific. So the Adobe application will just be called Adobe. Uh, the biggest examples are operating systems. So DOS, uh, your, your, main, your DOS operating systems, Windows, Mac, all of those. Your word processors, so Microsoft Word, uh, Apache Word, spreadsheets such as Excel, uh, database such as Access, graphic software, which is Adobe Creative Suites, those can be a bit, those are very complicated softwares and are very large uh, packets. We have a very good class directly on Adobe Creative Suites. Uh, for spreadsheets, which one person said was their main, was their, uh, main focus, we have a very nice, class taught by, I believe, one of the three best, uh, one of the three highest rated teachers in the country for teaching um, the current Excel system. Uh, Internet browsers, Internet Explorer is the one that uh, we have is most common. I believe that still wins the most common. I know Chrome is edging it out. And email is almost always done through Outlook these days. So some people do use a browser for it instead. So understand the internet, uh, the World Wide Web, a term not normally used anymore. We just stick to internet. Uh, it's just internet connected computers and servers, which are used for basically everything these days. Uh, I know some refrigerators have the internet on them for reasons that elude me. Uh, the web is one part of collection, a collection of documents and resources that are expressed to the internet. A web browser is a software that allows you to browse the internet. Um, this has a, a lot of purposes, and some browsers have very specific purposes. Uh, some do different things, mostly for how to find very, very specific information, or they're limited in some way due to your company or your school not letting you, you know, have access to everything 
for a lot of reasons. Um, these are the most common browsers. Uh, what browsers does everyone use here? Uh, do you, are you aware? Personally, for work, I use uh, Google Chrome. It's a little easier for an office environment since it's not too intensive on a computer if you don't open too many things at once. At home, I use Mozilla Firefox um, because I find it a bit more efficient to look through. Um, all of these are based very much to taste, except Apple Safari, which is the default browser for Apple computers, which, uh, works best on that platform. It doesn't really work in any other computer. Uh, search engines. These are the part of, these are the websites such as Google, uh, Bing, Ask Jeeves if it's still around, uh, Yahoo still exists, uh, that allows you to search the internet more quickly. This uses uh, internet tags such as, um, so if you, if you look for video, that would be a tag. Any major search term would be considered a tag, and that's how uh, search engines work. Search engines work in most cases. Um, a search engine is not a browser, and that's a piece, a little bit of confusion we get quite a bit. Um, your browser connects to a search engine, but you're not ever going to launch a uh, a software called Google to search things. It usually operates in something else. Uh, Edge is a software that's become the most common for Windows because they're trying to default out of Internet Explorer to have Microsoft Edge be their new one. Uh, it's actually quite a nice system. It's very clean looking. Uh, the environment for Edge is fairly simple. Um, this is what the current tile base looks like. They really like those uh, quick buttons. So the most common websites you go on will create one of these tiles that lets it lets you more easily find what you're trying to get to on a daily basis. Um, on the bottom of the screen, you'll see that blue circle symbol. It looks like a wave, or I think it looks like a wave. I think it's a circle wave. Um, that's the symbol for Edge. Uh, the terminology for an for a browser is fairly simple, um, but will not. I don't think most people use them every day. So the, bet, so the term we're gonna focus on first is for the URL. That's the bar on the top up there. That's usually also used for a search, for your search suggestion, suggestions, but it's also where you would put in the address. So we'll focus first on the, on the search bar. Um, the real power of the internet is to be able to specify your own search. This lets you put in pretty much any term and it will autofill in most cases based on what you're looking. The chosen example is 5K. There's a lot of terms that can widely focus on 5K, uh, but the search suggestions, which usually traces back to what you've done in the past, um, is for exercise in this case. It's for running races, uh, marathons. Search bar, any information you put into it, it will try to search for. Uh, you have to remember that the more broad the search is, the more results you'll get but it might not be something you care to see. Whereas a more narrow search will vastly limit your choices, but it'll probably be closer to what you're looking for if you know the right terms. Um, oh, and the other term for these on the search bar, if you're putting in an address is a URL. It's a term you'll hear quite a bit if you call tech support or you speak to it to a technician. Um, that would just be the web address. The URL is uh, the main term. It's a main, it's an older term for a web address. Uh, so www.yahoo.com is a URL. In most cases, people will just put yahoo.com. So just saying that for an address is just fine. URL, by the way, stands for Universal Resource Locator. Um, this is exactly why this term isn't as common for most people. 
it's because it's very long and not easy to remember for most people. Uh, this is why we normally use the term uh, address. So web address is the most common. Ours is www.newhorizons.com. Uh, you generally don't need to put HTTPS. That is just for uh, narrowing down search terms specifically to external websites. So you can just ignore that in most cases. Uh, Bing, which is an older search engine that's still around and I believe is owned by Microsoft now, is the default web address for Internet Explorer and for Microsoft Edge. Uh, from there, you put the search into the search bar right there in the middle. Um, you'll see it right here. That's the general search bar in most cases. Why it's not and uh, why it's not on top is because this current system is using a direct Bing uh, search screen, which is why it lists a version of favorites in the bottom. Uh, those favorites are also will also limit towards what's popular right at that moment, depending on how you have it set up to view. Uh, popular pages can be based on your old searches, or just based on what's trending globally. It really depends on how you have your computer set up and what you do on a daily basis. Uh, so if you go on to say CNN a lot, your popular will almost always show you news sources instead of uh, things like you know, reality TV. It, it will usually focus towards what you find more uh, preferable. So links, uh, hyperlinks are those blue text you see on the internet. Anytime you Google, you're going to see those blue texts. That is just a hyperlink. Uh, it is a shortened or simplified version of a URL used to more easily get to the average website. Uh, whenever you click to a pointer, whenever you move your pointer to a, UR, to a hyperlink, it will turn into a hand to indicate you're going to click on that or you're selecting something. It does that when you go over images as well, usually. Sorry about that. So Internet Explorer is the, is the basic operating system for Windows 10 that is changing in the next few months to Edge, uh, but they operate very similar, or very similarly. So if you press your Windows, bu your Windows button on the top left, uh, on the bottom left of your keyboard, that will open your start menu. If you type in Bing, that will bring up this page in most cases. Uh, the four arrows in your keyboard will allow you to move the panes in the bottom to show you a more wide view of what's common at the time. So again, popular pages, uh, hotspots, those are usually done through your arrow keys or you can just click around. It's generally easier to click. Um, on your search, on your searches of, search for your choice, you can when you uh, type in any search, you're gonna pull up on Bing. You will get uh, a general hyperlink that shows basic information. Of what your of what new website. So if you look for say tiramisu, the cake, and you Googled it, it will show you a list of hyperlinks. Let me pull up a let me pull up an example. So tiramisu. No, I don't know why I'm focusing on tiramisu. I think I'm just hungry. Um, these texts here is always a hyperlink. You'll notice it's almost always underlined if you hover over it. Um, these are the easiest way to search for anything online. And you'll notice it did default to Bing. That would be that symbol there now. Um, if you don't want to use Bing, you can go to google.com. This is, this is the most common uh, internet search engine today. It is generally more efficient than Bing because they have a wider, a wider um, icon or a wider library of search terms. Um, if you want to pin this software to your desktop, on the bottom right, you would find its icon, right click it and hit pin to, pin to taskbar. That will keep it there at all times so you can get to it a little bit more easily. Uh, computer viruses and malware. This is, um, if you're working on your office computer, you won't deal with these especially often. Your IT department will generally cover these. If you're at home though, this is moderately important 
is if you don't have um, if you don't have a, a more savvy understanding of antivirus softwares. So a virus is a computer. A computer virus is a uh, program or piece of code that's loaded in your computer without your knowledge to run against your wishes. Uh, generally, it just does things you don't want your computer to do. Sometimes that would be sending information back to whoever made the virus, or making your computer open things or close things that you don't want it to do. Uh, most normal viruses operate in, I'd say, three different uh, modes or methods of use. There's uh, the ones that were just made for pranks. Uh, these are some older viruses operate like this, where all they do is have your computer randomly type text, which can make your work very annoying. Or they'll randomly close your computer or you know lock out software, or delete things. These are becoming less common, uh, mostly because they're usually very simple and they don't have a specific purpose. Uh, there's business level ones, which their entire purpose is to pull information from your computer to, to send back to the person who made it so they can sell that information to other people. Um, the most common version of this is called a keylogger. Uh, what these do is everything you type, it records and sends back to the person who made the virus. These can be quite serious if you keep information on your computer for banking. Um, these are usually fairly easy to avoid, uh, and they're becoming less common because almost every antivirus software on the planet uh, focuses really hard on keyloggers since they're a major source of financial fraud. Uh, the third is, I don't believe on this, on this slide deck, uh, is ransomware. These are becoming less common than they used to be, but they're still out there quite a bit. These are these are softwares that will that will lock out your computer and encrypt everything so you can't get access to it, and then usually try to get you to pay them to uh, make that go away. These can be quite obnoxious. Um, in nine, I'd say ninety nine percent of the time, you could just reformat the computer, go to a computer repair company, contact your IT, have them deal with it. Never pay these people anything. You will not get what you wanted out of it. You will likely not get your so your com your computer back to what you want it to be, and they'll just keep bother. They'll keep trying to harass you for money. Uh, so never never negotiate with them. That's just good advice in general. Don't negotiate with people who uh, try to blackmail you. It's not good advice or not good uh, not a good thing to do. Uh, malware is specifically for two purposes. It's to damage or disable your computer. It generally doesn't have a specific need behind it. So people do it just because they want to cause a problem. Um, they're most common with when you download things, you sh probably should have been keeping track of what was in it. If you stick to main, main websites, you won't have to worry about these too much. So like, you know, YouTube, you're not, you're not going to get malware. Uh, antivirus softwares are the main software that's used to keep these softwares out of your computer. What they do is they keyword everything that goes in your computer, looking for specific terms in the software. Uh, so you, you wouldn't see this unless you went into the source code of the virus. Um, it will look for those, those specific terms and pull that software out of the computer or, in, or vault it in most cases. Um, this prevents, disarms, or removes malicious software or malware. Um, some antivirus are better than others. Uh, in general, they're fairly similar. Some of the more serious ones that are quite expensive are really good at this, but they can be more, they're more useful for offices than they are for a personal computer, mostly due to their cost. Uh, free antivirus softwares are Norton, Avast, uh, Microsoft Security Essentials, AVG, and Windows Defender. Um, almost all Windows computers right now operate with Windows Defender, and some will come packaged with Norton. I personally use AVG. It's a, a very good software for most antivirus purposes, though I also pay for the more advanced version of it. Um, when you're on the internet, you're going to find there is a technique called phishing. You're mostly going to see these when they send you send you an email, an email that says, you know, this is from, say, Amazon. That says your account is being locked out for some specific reason. 
and ask you to click on an icon that will take you to their website. 90% of times you see this, uh, you can avoid this by checking the address on the top. If it doesn't say amazon.com or it doesn't say what you would expect it to say, you can safely delete this email. In most cases in these, the better option is to delete the email, then go to the website that you trust. So just go to amazon.com, which is the one that I see this on mostly, and just try to log in. If it tells you you're locked on that website, you're pro it was probably legitimate. Um, if it doesn't, that means it was a phishing scam. Their purpose is to trick you to give, you, they give them your passwords or your credit card information or your account numbers. Uh, so those are the most common internet scams right now. Uh, so general desktop elements, um, we spoke with the Windows library earlier. Uh, I showed you a quick overview. Um, if you look on, on the uh, top of this, the tabs, those are how you mostly navigate this uh, for the most more detailed things that aren't going to be on your, uh, on your main quick bar on the left side. It's otherwise called the navigation pane. Um, I personally call it quick bar, uh, m probably because I've been doing this for too long and I remember when that was the common term. Um, in the middle of it, it'll always show your icons and right above that an address bar. The address bar is very similar to a URL or it'll give you a general description of where all these files are on your computer. If the more you know how to read that, the better you are equipped to search through your computer, though it does take a little practice. Uh, inter interesting enough, our A plus class uh, covers that in very broad detail, teaching you how to figure out how to navigate everything in Windows incredibly easily. Um, I have found that's probably the best class for going through how to navigate Windows or troubleshoot Windows on a daily basis. It's also very good for hardware modification, for hardware work. It teaches you uh, what parts of the computer do what, so, so you have a better idea of how to fix a computer. Uh, so files are anything that's not, an, or any, files are any type of application in your computer that's not generally a wider software. So if you have a Word document that you've created that is just a, a shopping list, that would be a normal file. And folders are where you store files. As I showed you before, uh, when you right click, you can go new and then folders. That's how you create a new folder. Creating a new file, it depends on what you're doing with it. Notepad would be the easiest way to create a Word, a Word file, but others do exist, such as Adobe. Uh, so the average desktop environment is fairly simple to search through, uh, though the terms can get quite they're descriptive, but I found that people who don't use them on a daily basis tend to not remember them. So the first one you'll see uh, here on the top is for minimize. That's the under the lowercase bar. That's to make a window shrink to the bottom of the taskbar so that it's out of your way. Uh, maximize will bring it back up It'll, so it takes over the entire screen. And those are always on the top right of any window. Those are the two you most have to remember. Uh, the red X will usually be called close or to exit out. It depends on who you're talking to, but those are the two most common terms. Uh, the quick access toolbar is those uh, icons up on the top here. Um, those have three basic functions and that's to save, undo, and redo. Uh, saving it does exactly what it says in the tin. It saves the document depending on how you have it worded. Sometimes it'll, act, it'll ask you to name it just in case. Uh, undo and redo are mostly used to fix something you might have caused on accident or to bring something back up if you need to see what it looked like before that. Uh, most people will be generally familiar with undo and redo, especially if you work in an office environment. So common tools and programs are, there's a, a few for Windows that people will probably be very familiar with. Uh, these will be category, uh, category screen apps. These are installed on Windows by default every time. Uh, the most common one is the calculator. Uh, as you can see, it's a calculator. This one's a fairly simple one. Um, you can actually expand to add more information to the average uh, Windows calculator. Uh, you can have it do budgets. You can go full scientific, which 
It's a bit more complicated if you don't, if you're not familiar with using one. I have found they're becoming less common in schools these days, mostly because smartphones have dominated uh, that industry. Though I don't think there are a lot of deals with testing. I'm not sure. I haven't been in school in a while. Um, it does have an option for doing mortgage or very specific things, um, though those can be kind of hard to find. The best way to do that is to click on view, and that's uh, this icon here. So let me pull up the calculator and I'll show you. Because this is actually much easier to see uh, someone do it than it is to look on a, on a screen. So if you hit view, it'll show a wider version of everything that this, this uh, calculator can do. There's a few more of these, um, but they tend to fall into very specific term, uh, very specific uses. Uh, I find that the mortgage software for these is actually not super intuitive because it doesn't work very well. Though the fuel, the fuel one, uh, fuel economy one, is surprisingly useful if you know your car's fuel economy. Now, a few other common apps would be Microsoft Paint. Um, this is less useful for offices day to day, though I do find it useful for copying images into certain documents when you're trying to work on them. Um, that's this one. And then there is Notepad, which I think is the one people use most, or at least I'm familiar with people using the most. And that's just a normal, you know, this is a normal a word processor. So the paint tool is the one I, just, I had showed you a moment ago. Um, you don't normally have to worry about the path. If you press the Windows key and type in paint, that will pull that uh, paint up automatically. But this is the general path because it's always stored in accessories. So if you uh, click on the Windows button, go to all programs, accessories, you'll find paint. Uh, it's a really simple graphics program. I find it a bit easier to use in Photoshop though it's much more limited than Photoshop. Um, Photoshop is the bigger Adobe software used for graphics editing. It can be quite expensive, though it is much, much better than Paint is for almost anything you could be using it for. It can be used to create images and edit images. Uh, WordPad's the next one. Uh, I showed you this one a moment ago. It's a general text editing software. It's Fairly simple to, for all general purposes. Um, it works almost as well as Microsoft Word does, though it's more limited in um, templates and how to get how to find certain very specific uh, things, such as say adding uh, things like a spreadsheet section to a Word document, or for anything that's not just text. Um, so adding images doesn't work very well in WordPad. Uh, when you save, it's almost always going to save in this kind of path. So it'll do choose your folder, then name your folder, and it'll go through this whole uh, rigmarole of having to find the right document. 90% um, of the time, it'll just default to, de to uh, documents, though. So you wouldn't have to worry about it unless you want it to go to a very specific folder. Uh, Microsoft Word itself uh, has templates. WordPad, it's, WordPad doesn't usually. Uh, Word is the most common Word is the most common text processing software in the industry right now. So if you work in an office, you're probably familiar with this one. Uh, so it's major templates and it's um, start screen. This is what it will look like. Um, if you use a search screen, it will almost always pull up Word if you have Word installed, but it will generally be on the start page. Uh, this is the the quick the quick access for everything Word does. Uh, so you'll see the file tab on the top left. That will take you actually back to this screen, uh, but it won't close anything. So if you click the back arrow on the screen, still it'll just, this one right here. That will take you back to the screen. So that's a quick tip for you if you ever have a problem getting back to that. Of that's the quick access toolbar that does save and read save undo and redo. And then you'll have your tile bars, which are right here. 
those give you the more wide layout of Word. Um, under that is your text insertion, uh, basically entire document stored down there where you can modify your margins, uh, scroll through the document, or view it in different ways, such as to zoom it or to see what its current status is. So it'll show you things like, uh, you know, if you, have a t if you have a spelling error, it'll generally show you what those errors are. Uh, the ribbon, which is this section here, is the different tiles. If you look up here where it says tiles, those go to different ribbons. Those all do different things depending on what version of Word you're using and what you're trying to do. Uh, the home one almost always focuses on font, uh, text size, or how it's uh, organized on the uh, page. So it can be a title screen, or can you know it can it can word itself in different ways. The backstage view, if you click on file, it'll take you here to the backstage view. If you click info, uh, that will show you the information for the file. Uh, so if you hit open on the left side, that will uh, let you find new files that you have on the computer. So you can click open and I'll open what you have previously, or if you click new, that'll create a new one. Uh, save will save the one you have currently open. Uh, save as, uh, we'll save it, save that file as a copy. So you can just click save as, then a different name and it will create a new one for you. Uh, print does exactly what it says in the tin. It prints you a copy of that document. And then close, closes the entire thing. Uh, share and export are more specifically used to share the document over a network or to move the, move the file to a different kind of software. That's a bit more advanced function. We cover that in our uh, A plus course, and it's also covered in Word Essentials. Uh, the ribbon that we went over earlier and the tabs in, in that are covered a little bit more in more detail here. Um, so the ribbon is a wider description of what you're working on uh, to let you edit the text a bit more coherently. Um, if you look onto this version here where it says normal, that's just for normal texting. No spacing will remove uh, all wider spacing. Then heading makes it a header on the top uh, for a title. There's also one called title, which uh, makes it bigger and focuses it directly in the middle. Uh, you change your font here. So Calibri is usually the body, and then it'll have the size. Sorry about that. My throat goes out on me once in a while. Um, and you can make some other edits such as color, bold text, um, list forms. And that, that's the general for the view window. Then there's some commands to search and replace, which can get a bit more complicated, but are generally not too hard to understand. But that's why we have our Word Essential Essentials course. Uh, your tabs on the top are for going through all the other ribbons. Um, some of those can get fairly and fairly in depth on weird functions of Word, such as the design and mailing section can be a little odd. Uh, your general commands are the ones on the right there, uh, over here. Those are for uh, find, replace, and select. Those are general commands. Those are also done through function keys if you know which ones to use. Uh, then there's the groups. Uh, groups are not actually saved here. Um, but they'll show um, how to group different types of files or different groups of commands. The font dialog box is for changing how your text looks, depending on the type of document, um, what you prefer to look at, look at in text, or the type of text you need for, say, underscoring, bolding, italics, which, um, are generally used for different purposes, such as if you're writing a document and you need certain keywords to be focused on, or if you need them to be crossed out for whatever purpose. It really depends on what the document is. Um, if you uh, are working in an office, you'll notice Calibri and Times New Roman are the current and most common ones. I know some people specifically avoid anything that looks more rounded and soft uh, in its font, because it tends to look a little bit unprofessional. So if you open uh, Word, you can type in your first and last name and that will always bring it up in Calibri 11 as its default uh, font. And typing your first name 
uh, your first and last name will, in this case, let you see a good approximation of how the font will view. Let me pull it up and I can show you. <coughs> so here you will do, see, Ethan Mossman. And if you need to make it bigger, you'll click on the, you'll go to fonts up here. You'll click the size and say, we'll make it 20. Oops, forgot to highlight it. There you go. That makes it to size 20. And then if you want to change the font, you'll highlight it again. You go here and we can change it to, you know, Adobe Gothic. You can also change the colors. And basically anything you need to do to the text will make it look slightly different. So bold, which won't really do anything with Adobe Gothic, I should have realized that. But italic, and there's underscore. There's different versions of underscore. Those are depending on what you, how you want to look. I don't think most people do those on a daily basis. I don't need to save that. Um, the styles gallery, if you focus over it on the bottom, on the top of there, where it had the different versions of that, of the uh, how the text should look, those are the styles gallery. Those are the most common ways you want to make it look some, somewhat different. They can be quite useful depending on what you're doing. Uh, or you can create new ones if you have a marketing position or you work with documents that have to look a specific way to make them differentiated uh, for basically any purpose. Um, it's very a little too wide to focus on for every specific style. Uh, undo will undo anything you do to the uh, file. So say you change the font, you change the size, you can click undo and that will always revert it. Um, we went a little bit over this earlier, creating files and managing folders. Always name your files. Uh, don't let it default to um, you know file one, file two. It just makes it harder to find. Uh, save semi-often. You don't want the power to go out and lose what you're working on. Um, I have done that. It's a nightmare. Uh, keeping your files organized with folders is just a good idea. It makes it easier to keep things uh, just easy to find. You don't have to keep your folders on the desktop, but it is suggested uh, if, you're have, if you have trouble finding things. Um, we keep this on here because uh, for most people, if you don't know how to search file manager on a daily basis, or you don't have an in-depth knowledge of where your documents folders can be stored, it's just best to keep it on the, do on the desktop. You can actually nest uh, <clears throat> folders within each other. In that you can nest folders within each other to make it a little easier to track things. Uh, deleting unwanted files keeps clutter down. It also makes your computer go a little faster if you have thousands of them, which can become a problem. Uh, entering your recycle bin is fairly easy. I don't have a copy, uh, an example that I can use right now because mine is empty. Uh, on your recycle bin, if you right click it on the desktop and go to empty, that will clear your recycle bin. Uh, everything you've deleted will just be gone always make sure you wanted to delete things before you do that. Doing it once a week is not required, but it is generally a better idea. Uh, actually, I have one of these right here. Um, this is a flash drive. These are uh, fairly common. I think everyone probably has one sitting in a, uh, you know, sitting in a box somewhere. This one's 128 gigs, so it's a fairly large one. Um, these are for backing up files and folders. Uh, when using these, it's best to store them somewhere safe, uh, not to throw them in a desk. Um, because if you have important files backed up, uh, say family pictures, work documents, um, legal files, I've seen a lot of those. Um, if you want a copy of them, uh, save them. So if your computer go dies, you know, your hard drive fails, the power supply burns out, uh, the, something happens to it, you don't want to lose important documents. Um, these are always connected on a USB bus. That would be the little, little rectangle uh, connection. That's USB. Um, these are fairly cheap now. Uh, I believe a 128 gig one will set you back about $15. Uh, 
you don't normally need one this big. This is for like moving big files or moving a lot of software um, or operating systems, actually. But if you need it for images, if you have hundreds of them, that's probably the way to go. I personally suggest getting one that you find that's in the 50 to 100 gig range. That way you can um, save everything you need in one place. It's easier to handle and you don't have to go worry about bouncing between hundreds of USB sticks, which I have personally had to do in the past when these were not available in bigger sizes. I don't know how many of you remember uh, when they first became a thing, when you could get like a 500 megabyte one. Those are tiny. I think they save like 10 images. So the bigger ones are magic to me. I think I love the bigger ones. So file hosting servers are another way to back up storage. Um, these are fairly common now, but they are a little hard to um, organize which one you might want to use. Uh, they're basically a, an online version of a flash drive. They're a great way to store images, files, videos. Um, I know most people use them for family things and businesses use them for important documents, though businesses usually use internal ones, not online ones. Uh, it's basically a storage platform. Uh, it's basically using a, uh, um, what's a good name for us? What's a good storage company? Not U-Haul, uh, public storage. It's like public storage. Why can I not remember public storage? Uh, the, when, OneDrive is the free one for Microsoft. It's not strictly free um, once you get past a certain size. Uh, but the hard drive in the cloud, so this is a hard drive. Um, this is what stores stuff in your computer. Uh, these can range fairly large, though nowhere near the size of an online storage system, such as OneDrive. So these are better for storing things you might need on multiple computers, things you cannot afford to lose. Uh, OneDrive is a better option to use uh, than keeping on your computer all the time. And that's just the better option for most cases. Uh, it allows you to share your files or between different people, access them on mobile computers, um, send them to other people. If they also have OneDrive or you want to give them access to it, you can give other people viewing access to yours or even modification access if you want to let them uh, copy or edit things. Uh, that's not usually a great idea unless you know the person, but that's, a good way to do it if you uh, have family pictures you want your your like say your aunt in I don't know Saskatchewan to get access to it. Uh, other platforms are Dropbox, iCloud, and Google Drive. Dropbox is the more expensive version of this, uh, though I find it a bit more reliable um, to get access to because it's easier to search through. Though it is a little uh, more expensive, as I said iCloud is the one used by Apple. Uh, it's mostly used on their phone services because uh, it allows you to transfer phone numbers, images, and such between different phones if you, if you lose yours. I believe that's why it was originally invented. Uh, now it has a much wider function focusing on uh, your, your computer files, uh, phone numbers, images, and business documents. Uh, Google Drive is the one a lot of businesses use. Uh, this one is more intuitive for editing uh, image files and text files, though it's good for practically anything. I quite like Google Drive um, just because of how simple it is to use, the, because it has the same kind of search functionality as a desktop does in most cases. Uh, OneDrive, you're given free a free seven gig allotment, or seven gigabytes. Uh, gigabytes are a measure of size for files. I believe the current uh, estimate for how many images, so if you have, uh, you know, I don't know, baby pictures, I think it's about a thousand of them per gig, depending on how big the picture is. So if, you, if it's very large and detailed, it's gonna be bigger, obviously. Uh, these are shortcut keys. Um, I said before uh, a little while ago that you're going to have functions on Microsoft Word that are controlled through keys as well. That's what these are. Um, I don't know many people that remember what all these are. Uh, there actually are websites that can list all of them. There's a couple hundred. 
they're very specialized and some of them i don't know people that use uh them at all um so like alt page up that one is not used very often but control v and control z are very common uh, control c and control v are the most common that i know i use them every day since it's the easiest version for how to copy and paste so control c will copy what you're doing so if you highlight uh say some text you do control c that copies it and then control z will paste it to somewhere else depending on where you have it uh you have your mouse clicked um, alt tab switches between your open apps um, it's an easy it's an easier version of the um of the multitasking software from for windows 10 though it's not quite as broad uh, alt f4 is how to close whatever application you have uh current, currently open it and it is used for uh, if you're just done with the software or if it's having problems you want to close it and reopen it that'd be the easiest way to do it if you can't get to the x key the x button uh, one you should probably use uh, whenever you're done with your computer is the Windows key and L. That will lock it, take it, pick you back to the login screen so other people can't mess with your computer. And there's several other ones. They're all very they're all very useful if you choose to use them for those purposes day to day. Uh, F5 such as, F5 is most common for being used in a browser. So if you're on a certain page and it's not working properly. If you hit F5, that will refresh the page, acting like you just went back to it. That will usually fix minor problems. Um, I would suggest taking a screenshot of this if you feel the need to. Um, it's, it's a good, it's a good like a uh, quick shortcut to have just in case. Uh, webmail. We're gonna go over a few terms of this and focus a little bit on how uh, the average email function works. I'm fairly sure most people in an office environment know how to use these, though I have been informed some people use um, them very simply. So they don't, they don't go into more detailed terms of this. We have a very good uh, Outlook class on how to do really focused or um, like bigger office work. It's, a, it's a, not a huge class, but it's very useful for uh, if you work as a corporate assistant or you handle marketing or HR. Uh, those are the words most common. So we're going to go over uh, basic functions, the interface, uh, some terminology, uh, how to create an email. Um, this is fairly simple. Uh, message organizing message folders a little bit and managing your contacts. So emails and email addresses, these are usually contacts. Uh, it depends on how you have them organized, but they always look like this. Every email you'll ever see, every, every email address will look in this general format. So an email client is always needed. Uh, Outlook is the most common one, um, though some people just go to the web the website for their email service, such as hotmail.live.com, uh, which are owned by the same company, uh, Yahoo, uh, Google Mail. They'll use those instead. But a, an application such as Outlook is most is most common. Uh, your email address is a string of information that's, that specifies a person and place. So if you look at the the beginning of this email address where it says Dietrich Brown, that's the person. Uh, devil tech example dot example is the is the place or the local and domain it's always made up of these two parts and then the at symbol so the local part is that person's unique name no one else can have that in the same company the at symbol designates that it's the person at then the domain so if you have you can't have more than one person on the same uh, unique user and domain so say you have Ethan Mossman at yahoo.com. There can never be another Ethan Mossman at yahoo.com. Just like you can't have two people with the same phone number if you want to call different people. It doesn't, doesn't really work. Um, any change to this will modify who you're emailing it to. So you're, if you remove that period between the name, it's going to cause problems. If you get the domain wrong, it's going to cause problems and will break the email meaning you'll get something called a bounce back. The bounce back is you get an email that says this could not be sent for whatever reason. It will always tell you what the general reason is, though it may be a little difficult to read. In, defin in general, though, it will always say undeliverable and then give you a brief summary. So opening an email account is fairly easy. 
um, where you'd go to um, any website that has this service that has an internet server mailbox. Uh, they're usually free. There are some that you charge that charge you, but they're usually charging you for something very specific. Like, say, you want the domain to be unique. Um, I used to have one called Ethan at the Ethan.com because I have too much free time on my hands. In this case, um, the unique domain is because uh, you'll have something like a business where you want to have a specific one. But those go into more; those are more detailed, and we're mostly going to be focusing on free accounts right now. Uh, the main examples are Hotmail, Gmail, and Yahoo Mail. These are the three most common right now. Uh, Hotmail is also is the domain that owns uh, at live.com and at mail.com. So if you're using Hotmail, you're probably using live or mail. You just have it changed to something else. Or you have the, you have the um, domain changed. Uh, web mails are services allow you to access your email as long as you have access to a, to a connection and a web browser. General email, general email terminology, or the most broad ones we're going to focus on, are spam. Uh, spam is, in, is irrelevant or inappropriate messages sent on the internet to a large number of recipients. If you get sent a, an email that you didn't expect, you don't know who the sender is, or you just generally didn't want it, it's probably spam. Uh, say the ones, that, the most common jokey ones are the ones where they say, oh, they'll send you, you know, some medication, or they pretend to know to know who you are, but they don't actually ever say their names or there's a lot of misspellings, probably spam. The little hiccups going here. Um, attachment. Anything you attach to an email uh, with the button that looks like a paperclip, that's an attachment. So anything can be an attachment. So videos, audio files, uh, Word documents, spreadsheets, all can be attachments. Autoresponders are in a service in most webmails where if you uh, send an email to a person and it just automatically sends a response back saying uh, this person is out for whatever reason, they're on vacation or something like that, that's an autorespond. Uh, block is when you do not want to get emails from a certain a certain person anymore. The best way to do this is it, you'll right click it and you'll and uh, you right click the email and it'll say block or send to spam and it'll default that to spam in most cases. That marks it as something you don't want. It won't delete it, but it'll put it into a different folder that you don't have to look at it and about a week later it'll 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 delete them. Uh, bounces what we spoke about before. Uh, it's a bounce back or bounce. Uh, it's when it didn't reach their intended destination and it didn't go anywhere at all. Usually, it's this, usually this is a response. This is a response by an email address that no longer exists, or email address that was changed, or a mistake put on the email uh, address proper. Well, we'll have a couple of acronyms. Some of these are very specific that you want to deal with day to day, but they're important to know just in case. Uh, POP is one that's mostly used by IT professionals. It's a, a post office protocol. It's a type of client used to send email. Uh, when they're setting it up, you'll have POP or IMAP, Internet Message Application Protocol. Uh, these are just softwares or there are softwares, rules, or protocols, usually a protocol in this case, used to retrieve email messages. A protocol is a set of formal rules that describe how to transmit data, especially across a, a network of computers. Um, the way this works is uh, your admin will set a series of rules over what emails can be sent. Um, the most common one I'm aware of is if you're in marketing, and you want to send a file to say 50 different people, your administrator might have rules say, no, you can only send it to 25. Um, that's a, a very common normal protocol. And that's mostly to, to stop companies from spamming clients or other, other members of staff. If you've ever gotten a blast email or you're not allowed to send a blast email, that's because of a protocol. Uh, ISP is your internet service provider. Um, in most cases, your internet service provider is going to be whatever company is uh, providing internet, such as in the area, such as AT&T, you know, AT&T Sprint, uh, T-Mobile does this too. Uh, 
for cell phones. Um, they're pretty common. Spectrum is one of the biggest, biggest one in Los Angeles. Uh, hypertext, um, that's what we, we talked about before. It's a type of uh, scripting language used to make um, web pages, uh, hyperlinks, things like that. That's actually why, why hyperlink is called a hyperlink. It's because it's made up in HTML. A LAN is a local area, ne a local area network. Um, we, spoke of, we spoke about this before. It's a wired network, uh, usually in a private area. So it's going to be a building or an office or a house. That's a LAN. Um, they're usually wired. They're not generally Wi-Fi because that changes what its term is because it's no longer it's no longer limited at that point. It can go outside of the original purpose. Uh, for more email terms, we actually have them saved at lsoft.com slash resources slash glossary uh, dot asp. Um, this has a lot broader terms and give you a little bit more information, though it can get very technical. Um, we're in a web this is for webinars. We're in a webinar right now. Um, Zoom, um, Teams, some Skype systems. A webinar is any online event hosted by an organization, a company, a person to broadcast to a select group of people through their computers via the internet. Zoom is the current most common one. Uh, I, I like Zoom. Zoom works fairly well. Uh, you'll get a link that will take you to, to the current webinar you're trying to get to. Uh, those are all organized through, a, if you look on the image, a central server. And that acts as a router to send all of the, uh, all the people the video of what's going on. Social networks, most people right now are fairly aware of social networks, uh, even if you choose not to use them. Uh, the biggest current one is uh, Facebook, designed by Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, he invented this when he was a freshman at Harvard, um, though the original concept for it was designed by other people. He had just run with their software, which caused him some legal problems later in life. I think they made a movie about that. I'm pretty sure it was called The Social Network. The site takes its name from the books of photos or Facebooks that many colleges distrib uh, distribute so that freshman classes can get to know each other better. Uh, also, the reason it's blue, um, Mark Zuckerberg is uh, partially colorblind, and blue is the only major color he can see. So it's a little bit of trivia for you. Uh, Facebook lets you create your own homepage and put your information uh, for a specific network of people, which then you can widen it or, or shrink it depending on how you want to be public, private, or friends only. It's, it can be there's a lot of information on how you can organize that. Uh, reminders. Again, it's going to focus uh, on saving files, uh, saving as. I, we, we really like to keep to emphasize this because this is um, actually a thing that we see a lot of our students uh, forget to do. Uh, so saving things is really, really important. Um, even if you're sitting, still working on a document, if you're working on a document for more than 30 minutes to an hour, save it. It's just a good idea. It keeps you from losing things. Uh, keeps If you have a power outage, you won't lose what you're doing network edge, you won't lose what you're doing. If you have a Windows update that turns your computer off because, you know, whoever is uh, your IT department says you've been putting it off too long, you won't lose what you're doing. Uh, knowing the ribbons, this takes a little bit of practice, but it's good to do. It's, uh, it's good to know, always good to know how to use the tools you're working on. Keeping folders on, keeping folders on the desktop, it's just good to be organized. It's good to have that. Same thing with deleting files. And backups, backups are key. Even saving and backups are the same thing. It's just a different way to do it. Just do that all the time. It's just better to have. You do not want your boss to call you and go, where is, the, where is this document? You can't say your dog ate it or the power went out. You need a, you need a backup. It's good to have. Um, so... That's the end of the main class. We're going to focus after from here. Uh, you're going to want to speak to uh, a, a career consult, uh, consult for New Horizons if you want to learn more. Uh, I would especially suggest people who want to get more in depth on how to use their computers or how to uh, learn more about what we've talked about today. 
to look into our Office Essentials courses, A+. Those are incredibly useful in, in any job you'll do. Um, they're best used in office environments where you need to know how to use a computer day to day, which is most offices now. Um, you need to know how to use Word. You need to know how to use um, Windows the best avail best ability possible. And our our most of our um, our career counselors will help you find the best view for your job or for your career path. Uh, we'll make you a training program for you. Um, I do know that uh, some of our counselors are really, really good at narrowing down specific jobs. So we have some who are better with marketing jobs, uh, better with administrators. Um, I think we have some who do things like management positions. They focus really hard on getting you to where you want to be. And then we have our classes. We have some of the best teachers in the industry. Um, Almost all of them are almost all of ours here in Los Angeles actually hit our best teachers every year. They're very highly regarded in the field. And after you have your classes, we actually have career placement. Uh, we help you find a job in major companies. I know we have um, contacts with Microsoft, Cisco, uh, some government positions. We try to keep on top on top of this to make sure people succeed in what they're working on um, in their career. We want everyone. We want everyone to succeed. Uh, these are our the ways to contact us. You can go to uh, our LinkedIn website, um, which a lot of companies actually do have direct contacts with. Uh, I know we have a few. We have um, we have a, like counseling programs with like Kaiser Permanente and a few other big uh, major companies. We have our Facebook page. It's facebook.com/cdsnewhorizon. Uh, we have CDS New Horizons at Twitter. And our Instagram website, which is at, new, at NH Career Development Solutions. Or you can contact us more directly. Uh, Terry Mott is our uh, direct contact administrator. Um, they will get back to you usually within a couple hours. Uh, you can go to careerdevelopmentsolutions.com. Um, that will give you a really, really like wide view of every class we offer. Um, I personally am currently retaking my Network Plus. Um, we have a few people who um, take really advanced courses, people who take newer courses. We, we structure for any skill level. So we, on one level, we have A Plus and Windows Essential. And on the other hand, we have Cisco Masters who make me look like I am barely learning how to use a calculator. Those guys scare me sometimes. Um, but we have direct contacts at any any level you want to learn to contact or want to make your contact. Um, calling, we always have someone on the line between uh, 7 a.m. and usually up to 4 to 6, depending on what city you're in. Though 6.30 to 7 is pretty easy to get a, get a hold of someone. Oh, if you're with the VA, by the way, we have a lot of, we have a lot of uh, contact with the VA as well. Uh, if you know someone who is unemployed or is dislocated, especially with the current uh, coronavirus uh, lockdown, and a lot since a lot of people are having some issues with jobs, we have a referral program right now. Um, if someone uh, en uh, enrolls and starts a class, we have a hundred dollar Amazon gift card uh, for referrals. That's at careerdevelopmentsolutions.com/referrals. Um, okay, that's the end of our uh, end of our class today.